Chapter One of The Rover Boys in Camp by Arthur Winfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter One The Rover Boys at Home. All out for Oak Run, shouted the brakeman of the train as he thrust his head in through the doorway of the car step lively please hurrah for home shouted a curly-headed youth of sixteen as he caught up a small dress suitcase come on sam i'm coming answered a boy a year younger where is dick here i am replied dick rover the big brother of the others just been in the baggage car making sure the trunks would be put off he added say but this looks natural doesn't it after traveling thousands of miles across the pacific and across the continent from san francisco put in sam rover do you know i feel as if i'd been away for an age it's what we've gone through with that makes you feel that way sam came from tom rover just think of being cast away on a lonely island like robinson crusoe why half the folks won't believe our story when they hear it they'll have to believe it sam hopped down to the depot platform followed by the others one of the folks got that telegram i forwarded from buffalo they must have for there is jack with a big carriage said tom and walked over to the turnout he mentioned hello jack he called out how is everybody master tom ejaculated jack ness the rover's hired man back at last are ya and safe and sound sound as a dollar jack how are the folks your father is putty well and so is your uncle randolph your aunt martha got so excited a thinkin you was comin home she got a headache dear aunt martha murmured tom i'll soon cure her of that he turned to his brothers what shall we do about the trunks we can't take em in the carriage aleck is comin for them boxes said the hired man there's his wagon now a box wagon came dashing up to the depot platform with a tall good-looking colored man on the seat the eyes of the colored man lit up with pleasure when he caught sight of the boys well 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 he ejaculated leaping down and rushing forward here y'all all at last bless you i's been dat worried about yo i couldn't most sleep for three nights and just to think yo was cast away on an island in the middle of dat pacific ocean it's a wonder dem cannonballs didn't eat y'all up thanks but we didn't meet any cannonballs aleck i am thankful to say replied dick rover our greatest trouble was with some mutineers who got drunk and wanted to run things to suit themselves they might have got the best of us but a warship visited the island just in the nick of time and rescued us so i hid out of dat letter what yo writ yo father and to tink dat miss dora stanhope and de lane gals was wrecked wid yo it's wonderful it certainly was strange aleck but come i am anxious to get home here are the trunk checks and dick passed the brasses over in a moment more the three boys had entered the carriage along with jack ness tom insisted on driving and away they went at a spanking gait over swift river through the little village of dexter's corners and then out on the road that led to valley brook farm as my old readers know the rover boys were three in number as already introduced they were the sons of anderson rover a well-to-do gentleman who was now living in retirement at valley brook in company with his brother randolph and the latter's wife martha while anderson rover had been on a hunt for gold in the heart of africa the three boys had been sent by their uncle randolph to a military academy known as putnam hall here they made many friends and also a few enemies the worst of the latter being dan baxter a bully who wanted his way in everything baxter was the offspring of a family of low reputation and his father arnold baxter was now in prison for various misdeeds the first term at school had been followed by an exciting chase on the ocean after which the boys had gone with their uncle to the jungles of africa in a search after anderson rover after the parent was found 
it was learned that arnold baxter was trying to swindle the rovers out of a valuable gold mine in the far west but this plot after some exciting adventures was nipped in the bud the trip west had tired the boys and they hailed an outing on the great lakes with delight during this outing they learned something about a treasure located in the heart of the adirondack mountains and the next winter visited the locality and unearthed a box containing gold silver and precious stones worth several thousands of dollars during this treasure hunt dan baxter did his best to bring the rover boys to grief but without success after the winter in the adirondacks the boys had expected to return at once to putnam hall to continue their studies but three pupils were taken down with scarlet fever and the academy was promptly closed by the master captain victor putnam that gives us another holiday tom had said let us put in the time by traveling and later on it was decided that the boys should visit california for their health this they did and in the seventh volume of this series entitled the rover boys on land and sea i related the particulars of how they were carried off to sea during a violent storm in company with three of their old-time girl friends dora stanhope and her cousins nellie and grace laney it may be mentioned here that dick thought dora stanhope the sweetest girl in the world and tom and sam were equally smitten with nellie and grace laney being cast away on the pacific was productive of additional adventures and surprises on a ship that picked the girls and boys up they fell in again with dan baxter and he did all in his power to make trouble for them when all were cast away on a deserted island dan baxter joined some mutineers among the sailors and there was a fight which threatened to end seriously for our friends but as luck would have it a united states warship hove into sight and from that moment the boys and girls and the friends who had stuck to them through thick and thin were safe before the warship left the island a search was made for dan baxter and for those who had mutinied with him but the bully and his evil-minded followers kept out of sight and so they were left behind to shift for themselves do you think that we will ever see dan baxter again sam had questioned i hardly think so had been dick's reply but in this surmise the elder rover boy was mistaken as later events will prove the journey across the pacific to san francisco was accomplished without incident as soon as the golden gate was reached the boys and also the girls sent telegrams to their folks telling them that all was well mrs stanhope was staying at santa barbara for her health all of the girls had been stopping with her and now it was decided that dora nellie and grace should go to her again it's too bad we must part dick had said as he squeezed dora's hand but you're coming east soon aren't you in a month or two yes and what will you do go back to putnam hall most likely if the scarlet fever scare is over then we'll be likely to see you again before long and dora smiled her pleasure it will be like old times to get back to the hall again sam had put in but first i want to go home and see the folks right you are had come from tom i reckon they are dead anxious to see us too and so they had parted with tight hand squeezing and bright smiles that meant a good deal one train had taken the girls southward to santa barbara and another had taken the boys eastward to denver and to chicago at the latter city the lads had made a quick change and twenty-six hours later found them at oak run and in the carriage for the farm End of chapter one chapter two of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter two news of interest my boys my boys such was the cry given by anderson rover when he caught sight of the occupants of the carriage as the turnout swept up to the piazza of the comfortable farm home home again home again safe from a foreign shore sang out tom and leaping to the ground he caught his father around the shoulders 
aren't you glad to see us father he went on glad doesn't express it tom replied the fond parent as he embraced first one and then another my heart is overflowing with joy and i thank god that you have returned unharmed after having passed through so many grave perils how brown all of you look tanned by the tropical sun answered sam oh here is aunt martha and uncle randolph sam burst out the motherly aunt as she kissed him oh how you must have suffered on that lonely island and then she kissed the others we certainly had our fill of adventures came from dick who was shaking hands with his uncle randolph and more than once we thought we should never see valleybrook farm again we were real robinson crusoes went on sam and the girls were robinson crusoes too are the girls well questioned mrs rover very well auntie if they hadn't been we shouldn't have parted with them in san francisco they went back to santa barbara to finish their vacation i see well it certainly was a wonderful trip you'll have to tell us all the particulars this evening i suppose you are as hungry as bears just now tom is i'm sure oh aunt martha i see you haven't forgotten my failing piped in the youth mentioned with a twinkle in his eye and do i get pie for dinner yes tom and all you care to eat too we are going to make your homecoming a holiday good they were soon in the house every nook and corner of which was so familiar to them they rushed up to their rooms and after a brushing and a washing up came down to the big dining room where the table fairly groaned with good things gosh this is a regular christmas spread observed tom as he looked the table over tell you what aunt martha i'm going to be cast away every week after this oh tom don't speak of it after this you must stay right here neither your father nor your uncle nor myself will want to leave you out of sight pooh we can't stay home but we'll be careful of our trips in the future you can be sure of that have you heard anything about putnam hall since we went away asked dick during the meal the academy opened again last week dick answered his father we received a circular letter from captain putnam the scarlet fever scare did not amount to much for which the captain is very thankful i sent him a telegram stating we were safe said sam i knew he would like to hear from us the captain is a brick the best ever said tom with his mouth full of chicken and ditto mr strong put in dick referring to the head assistant at the hall exactly dick but no more jasper grinders in mine went on tom referring to a tyrannical teacher who had caused them much trouble and who had been discharged from the academy as already mentioned in the rubber boys in the mountains or josiah crabtree said dick referring to another teacher who had been made to leave putnam hall and who had wanted to marry the widow stanhope in an endeavor to get control of the money that was coming to dora crabtree's misdeeds had landed him in prison where he was likely to stay for some time to come while the meal was still in progress the boys began the recital of their many adventures and this recital was kept up until a late hour it was astonishing how much they had to tell and how interesting it proved to the listeners you might make a book of it said anderson rover it equals our adventures in the jungles of africa i am going to write it out some day answered dick and maybe i'll get the story printed the trouble is i can't end the tale properly how is that dick asked his uncle randolph you were all saved isn't that a proper ending for any book yes but what of the villain baxter didn't show himself and that is no ending at all he should have fallen over a cliff or been shot or something like that and we should have married the three girls put in fun-loving tom that would make the story even more complete well things do not happen in real life as they do in story books said the parent it is likely you will never hear of dan baxter again but we may hear from his father his father exclaimed the three youths in concert why arnold baxter is in prison added sam he was up to five days ago when they took him to the hospital to undergo some sort of an operation at the hospital 
the operation was postponed for a day and during the night he slipped away from the institution and disappeared well i never burst out dick isn't he the slick one though just when you think you've got him hard and fast you haven't at all haven't they any trace of him asked sam none so far as i have heard there was a report that he had gone to new york and taken passage on a ship bound for liverpool but at present the ship is on the atlantic so the authorities can do nothing i hope they catch him we all hope that sam for a few days the three boys did nothing but take it easy it was pleasant weather when they roamed around the farm in company with their father and their uncle or with alexander pop the colored man of work as my old readers know pop had been in former days a waiter at putnam hall and dick tom and sam had befriended him on more than one occasion for which he was extremely grateful yo boys is jest naturally fust-class heroes said aleck one day even if dem cannonballs had come after yo i don't think they could have cotched you no siree it's a pity you weren't along aleck answered tom i can't say as to dat master tom i got by all the hair-raising times i wanted when we was in de jungles of africa i's only sorry of one thing and what is that dat you didn't just go and frow dat damn bastard overboard from dat ship de fust time yo sot eyes on him show sure as yo am born he'll turn up some day to make mall trouble well if he turns up we'll be ready for him returned tom grimly how can yo be ready for a pusson what locks like a snake in de grass he'll sting before yo have de chance to spot him we'll have to keep our eyes open aleck answered the youth and then the subject was changed during those days the boys went fishing and bathing in the river and also visited humpback falls that spot where sam had had such a thrilling adventure as related in the rover boys at school what a lot has happened since those days said sam taking a deep breath tom do you remember how you got into trouble with old crabtree the very first day we landed at putnam hall i do sam and do you remember our first meeting on the boat with dan baxter and how we sent him about his business when he tried to annoy nelly grace and dora yes indeed say i am getting anxious to get back to the hall it seems almost like a second home so am i put in dick besides we have lost time enough from our studies we'll have to pitch in or we'll drop behind our classes father says we can return to the hall next monday if we wish i vote we do so so do i and thus it was decided that they should return to the academy four days later but during those four days something was to happen which would have an important bearing upon their future actions End of chapter two chapter three of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by Matt Perard. chapter three a midnight visitor the next day shortly after noon it began to rain and the storm increased in violence until the wind blew almost a gale the rain kept the boys indoors at which tom was inclined to grumble no use of grumbling tom said dick cheerfully let us improve the time by looking over our school books that will make it easier to slip into the grind again when we get back to the hall that is excellent advice richard said randolph rover whatever you do do not neglect your studies by the way uncle randolph how is scientific farming progressing said tom referring to something that had been his uncle's hobby for years a hobby that had cost the gentleman considerable money well uh, to tell the truth thomas not as well as i had hoped for hope you didn't drop a thousand or two this year uncle oh no not over fifty dollars then you got off easy i shall do better next year the potatoes already show signs of improvement good i suppose you'll be growing them on top of the ground soon then you won't have the bother of digging em you know went on the fun-loving boy innocently 
absurd thomas but i shall have some very large varieties i feel certain big as a watermelon hardly but big as a muskmelon then not exactly but about the size of a coconut eh no no they will be as large as i mean a little coconut pleaded tom while sam felt like laughing outright well well yes a little coconut you see we saw some big potatoes in california uncle randolph ah of what variety cornus bustabus or something like that sam what was the name do you know that must be something like it tom grinned the youngest drover took two men to lift some of those potatoes went on tom calmly two men thomas surely you are joking no uncle i am telling nothing but the strict truth but two men the potatoes must have been of monstrous size oh not so very big but they did weigh a good deal no question of it think of two men lifting one potato i didn't say one potato uncle randolph i said some of those potatoes eh the men had a barrel full of em thomas the uncle shook his finger threateningly at your old tricks i see i might have known it and then he stalked off to hide his chagrin tom that was rather rough on uncle randolph said sam after a laugh so it was sam but i've got to do something this being boxed up when one might be fishing or swimming or playing baseball is simply dreadful answered the other just before the evening meal was announced jack ness came up from the barn and sought out randolph rover found a man slinking around the cowshed a while ago he said he looked like a tramp i wanted to talk to him but he scooted in double quick order huh. we haven't had any tramps here in a long time came from randolph rover where did he go to down toward the berry patch did you follow him up i did sir but he got away from me you must keep a close watch for those fellows said randolph rover bluntly i don't want any of them getting in our barn and burning it down to the ground you are right randolph said anderson rover make them keep away from the place by all means jack i'll keep my eye peeled for em answered the hired man the wind was now blowing a gale causing the trees near the farmhouse to creak and groan and banging more than one shutter but the boys did not mind this and went to bed promptly at the usual hour a storm like this on land is nothing to one on the sea was the way tom expressed himself i don't like anything better than to listen to the whistling of the wind when i am snug in bed for the time being sam and tom were occupying a room in the l of the farmhouse and dick had a small bedchamber adjoining the boys were soon undressed and having said their prayers hopped into bed and were soon sound asleep it was not until half an hour later that the older folks retired anderson rover was the last to leave the sitting-room where he had been busy writing some letters at the desk that stood there as he was about to retire he fancied he heard a noise outside of one of the windows he drew up the curtain and looked through the glass but could see nothing it must have been the wind he murmured but somehow it didn't sound like it as he stepped into the dark hallway an uneasy feeling took possession of him a feeling hard to define and one for which he could not account i think i had better go around and see that all the doors and windows are properly locked he told himself brother randolph may have overlooked one of them he walked the length of the hallway and stepped into the kitchen and over to a side window as he had his hand on the window latch he heard a quick step directly behind him he started to turn but before he could do so he received a blow on the head from a club that staggered him then he was jerked backward to the floor silence muttered a voice close to his ear don't you dare to make a sound what does this mean he managed to gasp silence i tell you was the short answer if you say another word i will hit you again having no desire to receive a blow that might render him totally unconscious or perhaps take his life anderson rover said no more 
he heard a match struck and then a bit of tallow candle was lit and placed on the edge of the kitchen table by this dim light the father of the rover boys saw standing over him a tall man beardless and with his head closely cropped one glance into that hardened face sufficed to tell him who the unwelcome visitor was arnold baxter i see you recognize me was the harsh reply not so loud please unless you want that crack i promised you what brings you here and at such an hour as this i find it more convenient to travel during the night than in the daytime the police are on your track i know that as well you rover what do you want here what does any man want when he has been stripped of all his belongings i want money i have none for you bosh do you think i have forgotten how you and your boys swindled me out of my rights to that mine in the far west we did not swindle you baxter the claim was lawfully mine i can't stop to argue the question and i don't want you to talk so loud remember that no don't try to get up went on the midnight visitor as anderson rover attempted to rise stay just where you are he was feeling in his pocket and now he brought forth a strip of cloth with a knot tied in the middle it was a gag and he started to place it in anderson rover's mouth when the latter leapt up and began to struggle with all the force he could command stop i tell you cried arnold baxter softly stop and then catching up his club once more he dealt anderson rover another blow this time directly across the temple the gentleman wavered for an instant gave a deep groan and fell like a log to the floor End of chapter three Chapter Four of The Rover Boys in Camp by Arthur M. Winfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Four A Useless Pursuit. Half an hour later, Tom awoke with a start. For the moment, he could not tell what had aroused him. Then he remembered hearing the slam of a door or a window sash. Must have been the storm, he told himself and was about to turn over and go to sleep when he heard a gunshot from the direction of the barn something is wrong that's certain he cried sam wake up what's the row tom questioned the youngest brother sleepily before tom could reply they heard dick getting up and also their uncle randolph and aunt martha what did that shock mean demanded randolph rover coming toward the boys room did any of you fire it no it came from outside returned tom hark hello in the house came in the voice of jack ness wake up everybody something is wrong after this it did not take long for those upstairs to slip into some clothing and go below randolph rover ran to the side door to find it wide open dick lit the hall lamp saw a man running across the garden said jack ness who had his shotgun with him i yelled to him to stop and then fired the gun i think he came from the house how did you happen to be up asked sam one of the horses is sick and i was attending to him by this time some of the others were looking into the various rooms the desk has been broken open cried dick and the pantry in the corner too mercy save us shrieked mrs rover from the kitchen come here at once poor anderson has been killed killed gasped tom and then all ran to the kitchen as quickly as they could they found anderson rover lying where he had fallen and still unconscious there was a lump on his forehead and a thin stream of blood trickled down one side of his face thank heaven he is not dead murmured dick as he knelt beside his father but he has been struck some cruel blows somebody fetch water and a bandage the water was procured and also a bandage and under skilful treatment anderson rover was presently restored to consciousness where where is he he questioned when he could speak do you mean the person who struck you down asked dick yes i don't know got away i guess the villain he attacked me most foully 
i saw him running across the garden put in the hired man did he steal anything to be sure he stole something said sam he ransacked the whole lower floor by the looks of things wonder who it was put in tom it was arnold baxter answered his father arnold baxter cried the others in chorus are you certain asked dick yes he struck me down and then lit the bit of a tallow candle you see lying there then we struggled and he hit me again and that is all i know but i am sure it was baxter for i spoke to him he accused us of having robbed him of that mine out west was he alone asked randall rover i saw no one else we ought to follow him up declared tom now that he realized his father was not so badly hurt as had first feared that's the talk ejaculated dick wait till i get my pistol boys do keep out of harm pleaded mrs rover remember that this arnold baxter is a desperate criminal we are not afraid of him answered tom we'll show him that he can't come here and attack father added sam leaving their father in the care of their aunt martha the three rover boys armed themselves and sallied forth accompanied by their uncle and alexander pop the latter carrying a horse pistol of the old-fashioned variety dat dare baxter am a rascal of de fust water was aleck's comment he deserves to be shot full of holes and i am de boy to do dat same if only i gets de chance jack ness was closely questioned and he described the spot where he had last seen the unwelcome midnight visitor he had a bag of something over his shoulder he declared most likely the stuff taken from the house declared dick the party crossed the garden patch and then took the path which ran down toward the river here all was intensely dark although it had stopped raining and the wind was trying its best to scatter the heavy clouds that obscured the stars not a thing to see observed randolph rover we may as well go back let us scatter and make a search came from dick and his idea was carried out but though they tramped the locality for a good half hour the pursuit of arnold baxter proved useless he is probably making good use of his time was tom's comment he knew we would be after him hot-footed just as soon as we heard of his being here i'm going to drive over to the railroad station said dick he may hang around and get aboard of the first morning train take me along with you said sam and dick agreed they got Alec to drive them and took the fastest team the stable afforded but at the depot all was dark and deserted and if arnold baxter was anywhere near he took good care not to show himself nor was anything seen of him in oak run later on he has left the neighborhood by some other way said randolph rover and his surmise was correct when the boys reached home again they found their parent sitting up in an easy chair with his forehead still bandaged the blows he had received were painful but by no means serious and when the doctor was called in he said the patient would speedily recover but you had a narrow escape said the doctor had you been struck a little harder your skull might have been broken well i don't think arnold baxter would have cared if he had broken my skull answered anderson rover he is a thoroughly bad man it was broad daylight before a complete examination of the house was made and then it was learned that baxter had run away with some silver knives forks and spoons some gold napkin rings a silver and gold water pitcher and half a dozen similar articles from the desk he had taken a pocket-book containing three hundred dollars in cash and from anderson rover's person his watch and chain and a diamond stud he had also tried to rob the unconscious man of his diamond ring but as the ring would not come off had pried out the stone and taken that he is at his old tricks again said dick evidently his term in prison has done him no good guess it has made him worse added sam oh how i would like to lay my hands on him and tom said the same the authorities were notified including the sheriff of the county and later still anderson rover hired a new york detective to take up the case 
but it was of no avail arnold baxter did not show himself and not a trace of him was to be found anywhere i shouldn't be surprised if he disguised himself as soon as he got away from here remarked tom he could have easily put on a false moustache and a wig would fit capitally over that almost bald pate of his but where would he get the moustache and wig tom asked dick he may have bought them before he came here i have heard that some robbers prepare themselves for all sorts of emergencies only last week i was reading about a fellow who went to a ball and between the dances went out and robbed a gentleman on the street of his watch when he was arrested he tried to prove that he hadn't been outside of the ballroom all night and it was by the merest accident that the authorities found out his story wasn't true tom is right some criminals are very shrewd said his father and i fancy arnold baxter is about as slick as any of them well i hope we run across him some day said dick with so much to occupy their minds the days flew by swiftly and almost before they knew it monday was at hand and the three boys set out to return once more to putnam hall End of chapter four chapter five of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter five on the way to putnam hall the idea of going back to dear old putnam hall with all of its pleasant memories filled tom with good humor and he was fairly bubbling over on the train which carried the boys to ithaca where they were to take a steamer up cayuga lake to cedarville the nearest village to the academy makes me feel as i did the first time we went to the hall he declared don't you remember that trip and the fun we had with peleg snuggers the wagon man and then he burst out singing putnam hall's the place for me tra la lee tra la lee putnam hall's the place for me the best old school i know you'll have the conductor putting you off the next thing you know remarked sam putting me off never cried tom he knows that academy boys own privileges that other passengers do not possess he can't cork me up i defy him wonder if we'll meet any of the other fellows mused dick he had hardly spoken when the train stopped at a junction and two other lads got aboard and came down the aisle one was tall and handsome and the other stout and with a round chubby face beaming with good humor larry colby cried dick leaping up and grasping the tall boy's hand i'm awfully glad to meet you returning to the hall of course yes was the answer from the rover boy's old chum isn't it odd that i should be thinking of you just as we meet and he shook hands hello if it don't been damn rofer brothers already cried the round-faced lad with a twinkle in his eyes i deep me you vos left the hall for good ya yeah? hans Mueller came from sam then you are going back too i thought you had scarlet fever not much i ain't said the german youth i vos eat too much of dem buckwheat cakes already und dat makes mine face prick all it but i ain't got no scarlet fevers nein how you was already anyhow and he shook hands as larry had done i can hardly believe your story about being cast away on an island in the pacific said larry your letter read like a fairy tale if you tell the fellows they'll think you are drawing the long bow yes larry vos told me some dings about dot broke in hans you vos regular robinson roosters he said great scott robinson roosters yelled tom bursting out into a fit of laughter boys we are discovered at last well if you are you needn't crow over it came from larry roosters and crowing ah oh, larry i didn't think you'd begin to punt so early put in sam he just hatched it out said tom i suppose you think that sounds chick 
joined in dick and then there was a laugh in which all but hans muller joined the german youth looked blankly from one to another of his companions was dat robinson rooster a choke he demanded of it was let me in buy it vick oh you couldn't climb in on a gangway and a step-ladder combined answered tom put vos you robinson roosters or vos you not robinson roosters oh we were robinson roosters right enough answered tom when he could control his laughter then what you vos giggling about hey nothing only it was so funny to be a robinson rooster and live on a big island with nobody but lions buffaloes snakes and cannonballs added the fun-loving youth cannonballs queried larry that's what our pop calls em larry he said it was a wonder the cannonballs hadn't eaten us up and then came another laugh during which hans was as mute as ever was there lions snakes and buffaloes by dot island on went on the german youth to be sure there were hans and likewise elephants panthers cats dogs hippopotamuses mice elk rats and winged jibberjackers my gracious tom und you wasn't eaten up already quick none of the animals troubled us but the three-horned jibberjacker he came into our house one night crawled upstairs and began to swallow sam alive you don't told me yes i do tell you he had sam in his mouth and had swallowed him as far as his waist when sam began to kick on the floor with his feet i see i see hans eyes were as big as saucers that woke dick and me up and we ran and got sam by the legs and pulled for all we were worth you don't told me tom on what did dot what you call him do den he planked his ten feet on the floor and his ten feet did you say tom interrupted hans doubtfully to be sure didn't you know that a real jibberjacker has ten feet maybe i did i don't exactly remember about him i am surprised at your ignorance of natural history hans yes the real jibberjacker has ten feet although a branch of the family known as the jibber twister has only eight feet well go on he planked his ten feet by the floor tom he held on and so did we and it was a regular tug of war between us sam was followed as far as the waist and couldn't do anything to help himself you just ask sam if that isn't so when tom tells the truth it's a fact every time hans answered sam who felt as if he would choke from suppressed laughter so the blamed old jibberjacker held on and held on continued tom then we gave a tug and he gave a tug and all of a sudden sam came out the shock was so great it threw dick and me clear across the room and threw a doorway into the next room but the poor jibberjacker fared still worse how was that he flew up against the outside wall and his weight was so great he went right through the side of the building and landed on some rocks below all of his ten legs were broken and of course he couldn't get away so we went down got a long cross-cut saw and sawed off his head now if you don't believe that story you come to our house some time and i'll show you the cross-cut saw hans stared in breathless amazement his solemn face was too much for the others and a peal of laughter rang through the car at this hans grew suspicious and at length a sickly grin overspread his features i know you tom rofer he said dot was one of dem fish stories ain't it already no it's a jibberjacker story hans it was a jibberjacker fish story then anyhow you can't fool me some more i was too smart for dot already when i go by the academy i get mine ear teeth cut hey all right hans if you have cut your ear teeth we'll call it off said dick and here the conversation took a more rational turn so far as i know only a few of the fellows have left the hall on account of the scarlet beaver scare 
said larry and they were boys that nobody seemed to care much about i was told that the fellows expected to elect an entirely new lot of officers said sam we have been away so much i've rather lost track of our military affairs captain putnam said we would have to ballot for officers as soon as all the boys were back said larry some of the old officers had graduated you must remember i've not forgotten that i was once second lieutenant of company a put in dick reckon i'll have to try my luck once more if the boys want me to run well i want you to run for one dick said larry hans you'll vote for dick won't you ja und i wants him to vote for me too said the german youth why hans do you want to be water carrier this year asked sam nein i wants to be high private by the rear rank already one of the fellows told me dot would choose to suit me all right hans we'll all elect you high private of the rear rank answered larry with a laugh End of chapter five chapter six of the rover boys in camp by arthur winfield this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt berard chapter six fun on the boat at the city of ithaca the boys stopped long enough to get dinner and were here joined by fred garrison and george granbury two more of their old school chums hurrah for the gathering of the clans cried george granbury with a beaming face this is like a touch of old times how are all of you anyway first rate with the exception of hans here said tom he's got the buckwheat measles ja und tom he's got der jibberjocker fever declared the german boy bound to do his best to get square good for hans cried sam tom after this you have got to take care or hansie will roast you oh hans is just all right observed tom and when the german boy's face was turned away he took the latter's coffee and put into it about a teaspoonful of salt tell you what fellows this coffee just touches the spot he added loudly right you are said fred garrison never tasted better in my life so far hans had not touched the coffee but hearing the words he took up his cup and downed a deep drop it may be added that he was a german who loved coffee a good deal and frequently drank several cups at a meal for an instant the german youth said nothing then his face turned pale dot coffee was no good he gasped why hans cried several see how pale he is getting came from george granbury hans are you going to die don't say the coffee is going to poison him burst out tom i was reading about poison getting into the coffee at this hotel last week but of course did i got poison piped of coffee in here demanded hans to be sure but how fuss dot poison coffee taste anyhow i'm sure i don't know i think it was a little salty came from fred garrison my gracious me of dots so i was poisoned sure run for to talk to quick here eat some jam hans that will counteract the effect of the poison said tom and handed over a small dish with jam in it over which he had just sprinkled the pepper with an exceedingly liberal hand anxious to do anything that would stop him from being poisoned the german boy clutched the dish and took a large spoonful of the jam but as he gulped it he gave a gasp and the tears started down his cheeks don't mind zait he bawled i was part up alive by my mouth already take it away quick and jumping up from the table he began to dance around madly it's a serious case said tom if he's burning up we had better call out the fire department this remark made hans grow suddenly suspicious he caught up tom's cup of coffee and tasted it i know you tom rofer he said dot vos more tricks of yours ain't it he held the cup of coffee on high how you like dot hey and splash down came the coffee on tom's head and trickled down his back 
hi you let up roared tom and knocked the half-empty cup to one side let up i say or i'll have the landlord put you out i told you to take care tom came from sam when the other boys had restored quietness when hans gets his dander up he is dangerous dot is true came from hans i vants no more of them chokes already and then as the waiter came hurrying up he forced tom to order him another cup of coffee and took good care to keep it out of the fun-loving youth's reach poor tom sopped away the spilt coffee as best he could but it must be admitted that for the balance of that day his backbone felt none too comfortable yet he bore no grudge towards hans for he knew that he had deserved the punishment meted out to him down at the dock the boys found the golden star a trim little side wheeler ready to take them up the lake there were about half a hundred passengers bound for various landings and among them six putnam hall scholars including our old-time acquaintances jack powell generally called songbird powell because of his habit of composing poems and songs and that aristocratic young gentleman who rejoiced in the name of william philander tubbs the family is surely getting together remarked dick after another handshaking had been indulged in songbird do you warble as much as ever you can wager a sweet potato he does said george granbury nothing short of a cyclone will ever stop songbirds warbling eh songbird for reply the youth addressed turned a pair of dreamy eyes on the speaker and then said slowly with hopeful hearts and brightest faces to school we go to fill our places we'll study hard and do our best if songbird powell will give us a rest finished tom oh songbird have mercy on us and don't begin so early you're a good one to preach tom came from larry started to joke the moment we met him didn't he hans did i questioned tom innocently i had forgotten he turned to tubbs and how is our friend philliam willander to-day william philander if you please rover was the dignified reply i must insist on your getting my name correctly this term all right tubby old boy it shall be just as you say i wouldn't hurt your feelings for a big red apple then please don't call me tubby you know my real name is william philander tubbs don't you want esquire tacked to it too that isn't hardly necessary as yet but you may write it after my name if you have occasion to send me any written communication continued tubbs with greater dignity than ever phew but tubby is worse than he was before whispered sam to dick they must have been tuning him up at home tubbs is going to try for a captaincy this term said powell who had not minded tom's interruption of his versification in the least hurrah for captain tubbs cried tom captain allow me to salute you and he made a sweeping bow to the deck tom spoke so earnestly that tubbs was pleased and instantly forgot their little differences i shall be pleased to become a captain said the young gentleman i feel i can fill the position with credit to myself and dignity to the academy there is military blood in my veins for a second cousin on my mother's side was a lieutenant in a civil war besides that i have studied military movements at west point where i went to see the cadets drill do you know how to swab out a cannon asked sam with a wink at the others i shouldn't uh, care for such dirty work replied william philander tubbs with dignity or police a camp surely you don't think i was ever a policeman don't you remember what policing a camp is asked george granbury upon my honor i do not it means to clean up the streets burn up the rubbish and all that thank you but i do not uh, care to become a street cleaner returned tubbs with great dignity sorry but i'm afraid you are not cut out for a corporalship came from tom i didn't say a corporalship tom i said excuse me i meant a sergeantship no i said make it a second lieutenantship then tubby anything to be friends you know i said 
oh bother if you want to be a major-general go ahead nobody will stop you hurrah major-general tubbs cried sam that sounds well doesn't it fellows we'll have to present him with a tin-plated sword came from one of the crowd and a pair of yellow worsted epaulets added another and then songbird powell began to sing softly rub-a-dub-dub here comes general tubb he'll make you bow to the ground you must stop every lark and tow the chalk mark as soon as he comes around there you are tubby think of songbird composing a poem in your honor cried tom you ought to present him with a leather medal i-i don't like such um such doggerel cried william philander tubbs angrily i think well i never ejaculated tom in pretended astonishment and songbird worked so hard over it too thus doth genius receive its reward songbird if i were you i'd give up writing poems and go turn railroad president track walker or something like that you boys are simply horrid don't you know cried tubbs and pushing his way through the crowd he walked to the other end of the boat being away from school hasn't done tubby any good was fred garrison's remark he thinks he's the high tum tum and no mistake don't fret he'll be taken down before the term is over came from larry colby that's true added another pupil who had been taken down himself two terms before and when he hits his level he'll be just as good as any of us the time on the steamer passed quickly enough and after several stops along the lake the golden star turned in at the cedarville landing and all of the putnam hall cadets went ashore End of chapter six chapter seven of the rover boys in camp by arthur winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Ferrard. chapter seven something about the military academy as my old readers know cedarville was only a small country village so the arrival and departure of the steamer was a matter of importance to the inhabitants the boys consequently found the little dock crowded with sightseers and more than one face looked familiar to them there are the rover boys said one man quite loudly everybody knows em we are growing notorious it would seem whispered dick to sam back of the dock stood the big carryall attached to putnam hall with the old hall driver peleg snuggers on the box hello peleg old friend shouted tom waving his hand at the man how are we to-morrow as the clown in the circus puts it i'm all right master tom and will be so long as you let me alone was the deliberate answer from the driver he remembers you all right enough tom came from george granbury now peleg don't throw cold water on my enthusiasm said tom reproachfully i ain't throwing water on nobody master tom i'm only giving fair warning that i want to be let alone answered the driver doggedly no more monkey shines around me remember that all right peleg i'll remember and how is mrs green our worthy housekeeper first rate no whoop and cough no nor measles or chicken pox not a bit of em or mumps tell me now she really hasn't got the mumps has she see here master tom didn't i just tell you no you didn't tell me and that's why i'm so anxious to know if she's got the mumps and the chilblains and the ingrowing warts oh crikey i knew it groaned peleg snuggers i says to myself as i was driving over if that tom rover comes back i might as well throw up my job for he won't give nobody a rest if you would only all right peleg i see you are really and truly bound to go back on me you hate me tom drew his handkerchief from his pocket it is awful after all i have tried to do for you in the past i've got to to cry Boo -hoo -hoo. and the boy began to wipe his eyes look a here master tom it ain't nothing to cry about said peleg half suspiciously i only give you a warning you are so so hard-hearted peleg Boo -hoo -hoo. i want to go back home and tom began to sob 
this was too much for the driver and his face fell don't you mind me master tom he said softly i didn't mean nothing indeed i didn't you're all right i like you better than any of em oh dear burst out larry colby just to hear that peleg have you gone back on us demanded george granbury you ought to have a ducking for that put in another let's dump him into the lake come on a cold bath will do him good no no old cracky groaned the driver of the carryall this is a mess i i didn't mean nothing gents i indeed i didn't he's mean enough for anything that's what he means came from a voice in the rear pile in before he runs away and leaves us to walk to the hall and into the carryall the boys tumbled one over another dick got a seat beside the driver and away they went at a spanking gait through cedarville and then along the winding road leading to the academy two or three of the cadets had brought ten horns with them and they made the welkin ring as the turnout dashed on its way a ginger snap prize to the first fellow who spouts the academy cried sam as they made the last turn on the highway i see the hall shouted half a dozen voices in chorus and in a few seconds they came out into full view of the broad brick and stone building with its well-kept parade ground and its trees and shrubbery the parade ground came down to the edge of the wagon road and off to the other side of the land sloped gradually down to the lake glistening like a sheet of gold in the rays of the setting sun the boys set up a loud shout and a wild blowing of horns and in a moment a score of cadets came running forward to greet them followed by captain victor putnam the master of the academy and george strong his head assistant i am glad to see you young gentlemen said captain putnam as he shook one and another by the hand you look as if your vacation had done you good it's done me a pile of good said sam but i don't know as i want another like it you rover boys have certainly had some remarkable experiences continued the captain i congratulate you on escaping so many grave perils some time you must give me all the particulars but now it is time to prepare for supper i dare say the trip on the lake has made you hungry dot is so came from hans Mueller. i was so hungry like four lions already i have made some slight changes in your sleeping accommodations went on captain putnam mr strong will show you to your rooms then the boys marched into the academy led by the head assistant the majority of the cadets had their dormitories on the second floor of the building each room held from four to eight students and was both bright and clean the rules of putnam hall were similar to those in force at west point and every pupil was expected to keep his clothing his books and his other possessions in perfect order each had a cot a chair and a clothes closet to himself extra closets having been introduced in the rooms for that purpose and each was allowed the use of his trunk in addition each cadet had to take his turn at keeping the room in order although the dormitories were given a regular sweeping and cleaning once a week by the servants as before the rover boys were placed in one room and into this came also larry colby fred garrison and george granbury the apartment was at an angle of the building and next to it was another occupied by songbird powell tubbs hans and three other cadets between the two rooms was a door but this was closed and was supposed to be kept locked this makes one feel like home said sam as he began to wash up for supper right you are answered larry colby no matter where i go during a vacation i am always glad to get back to putnam hall a little later came the evening parade of the cadets who marched around the parade ground several times before entering the mess room as the dining room was termed the late arrivals did not join in the parade but they watched it with interest and then hurried to their accustomed places at the long tables where a plain but substantial supper awaited them only a little talking was allowed throughout the meal but at its conclusion the cadets were given an hour off in which time they could do very much as they pleased in that hour some played games others took walks and not a few drifted over to the gymnasium which stood at one corner of the grounds i'm going over to the gym said dick to larry colby want to go along certainly was the prompt answer i am going in for gymnastics this term dick 
want to win some of the prizes when we have our contests if i can i don't see why you shouldn't larry you seem to be in first-class shape physically i am going to try hard dick they were soon in the building and larry slipped off to the dressing room to don his gymnasium suit while dick was waiting for his friend to reappear he looked on at the efforts of the other cadets present some were on the rings and bars others were using the parallel bars and horses and still others were at the pulling and lifting machines in one corner two of the boys were boxing while another was hammering a punching bag as hard as he could the boy at the punching bag was a tall big-boned youth named lou flapp he was a newcomer at putnam hall but though he had been there but three weeks he acted as if half of the place already belonged to him at the start he had made a few friends principally on account of the money he had to spend but these were gradually deserting him dick was interested in the work on the punching bag and he walked closer to note what lou flapp was doing clap 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 went flapp's fists on the bag which bounced back and forth with great rapidity well how do you like that asked lou flapp as he paused in his exercise and stared at dick it's all right answered dick briefly i'll bet there ain't another cadet here can do as well went on lou flapp boastfully oh that's saying a good deal said dick some of the boys can hit the bag pretty well hm. lou flapp stared at the eldest rover harder than ever perhaps you think you can do it he sneered i didn't say that but your words implied it dick rover can do every bit as well said a cadet who overheard the talk i want to see him do it i didn't come here to punch the bag said dick as calmly as ever i just thought i'd take a look around hm. afraid to try eh oh no i dare you to show what you can do sneered lou flapp very well i'll show you came from dick and he began to take off his coat collar and tie End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of The Rover Boys in Camp by Arthur M. Winfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Eight: A Scene in the Gymnasium. Lou Flapp spoke in such a loud, overbearing voice that a crowd began to collect in the corner where the punching apparatus was located. "What's up?" asked more than one cadet lou flapp and dick rover are going to try to beat each other at punching the bag was the report rover will have to do his best then flapp is a prime one at bag punching it's about the only thing he can do real well this isn't a fair contest put in another student flapp took lessons from a man who used to do bag punching on the vaudeville stage if that's so i wouldn't try to beat him if i was dick rover dick heard some of this talk but said nothing he was soon ready for the trial and stepping up to the punching bag he began to undo the top strap that bag is all right blustered lou flapp yes for you answered dick but you must remember i am not quite so tall i must have it an inch lower it seems to me you are mighty particular i have a right to be when you do your punching you can raise the bag as high as you please that's the talk came from several standing near by this time larry was on the floor again and he came up to learn what dick was doing dick they tell me he is the best bag puncher here whispered larry i can't help it he will crawl over you if you don't do as well as he can do let him dick began his punching exercise slowly for he had not tried it for some time and was afraid he was a little stiff but it may be added here there was a punching bag in the barn at the rover's farm so the youth knew exactly what he was doing oh anybody can do that remarked lou flapp presently that's as simple as a b c well can you do this returned dick and branched off into something a trifle more difficult to be sure i can then what about this and now dick settled down to some real work clap clap went the bag this way and that yes i can do that too answered the tall boy i'd like to see you 
lou flapp was only too anxious to show his skill and having adjusted the bag to suit him he went at the work once again doing just what dick had done now do this he cried and gave a performance of his most difficult exercise it was certainly well executed and at the conclusion many of the cadets began to applaud dick rover will have to hump himself to do that remarked one i don't believe he can touch it said another with care dick fixed the bag and went at the exercise it was something he had not practised for a considerable time yet he did not miss a stroke and he wound up with a speed fully equal to that exhibited by his opponent good for you dick cried larry heartily they'll have to call it a tie suggested another cadet i'm not done yet said dick can you do this he asked to lou flapp and then commenced an exercise he had learned some time before from a boxing instructor it was full of intricate movements all executed so rapidly that the eye could scarcely follow them the cadets looked on in wonder lou flapp staring angrily at the performance wonderful i didn't know dick rover could do such punching say flapp you'll have to get up early in the morning to beat that oh shut your mouth retorted lou flapp angrily i can do ten times better if i want to let us see you i i i'm in no condition to go ahead just now remember i was punching the bag for an hour before rover got here how can that be when all of us just came from the mess hall questioned larry he is trying to sneak out of the trial said a voice in the rear of the crowd i'll sneak you roared lou flapp in a rage i want you all to know that i ain't afraid of dick rover or anybody else do you want the trial to continue questioned dick in an even tone didn't i just say i was tired out but i'll show you what i can do sometime blustered lou flapp oh all right you needn't think you're kingpin of the punching bag went on the tall boy who had lost control of his temper because of the exhibition thank you flapp what i think and what i don't think isn't any of your business pooh i've heard about you and your two brothers dick rover they tell all sorts of stories about you but i don't believe the half of them come come what's the use of quarrelling put in larry pleasantly i'm sure i don't want to quarrel answered dick he challenged me to punch the bag against him and i did so that's all you're dead stuck on yourself rover went on lou flapp slangily you think you're the only toad in the puddle but you ain't let me tell you that as soon as i heard about you i made up my mind i wouldn't knuckle under to you this isn't right cried larry dick is my friend and let me say he never asked any cadet to knuckle under to him unless the cadet did something that wasn't on the level that's true that's true came from half a dozen of the students dick rover is all right so you're all turning against me eh burst out lou flapp fiercely his face grown dark with rage i was warned of this before i came here who warned you asked tom who had just put in an appearance a gentleman who used to teach here what was his name questioned several mr jasper grinder he said he had left because the rover boys tried to run everything that old fraud cried larry he left because he was kicked out came from another and he is a criminal put in dick i can prove it if he wants me to do it oh you can talk all you please growled lou flapp i know what i know and don't you forget it and what is more dick rover don't you expect me to knuckle under to you if you try that game you'll get what you least expect and so speaking lou flapp forced his way out of the crowd and left the gymnasium well of all the idiots i ever met came from tom he believes in meeting trouble three-quarters of the way doesn't he i think jasper grinder must have stuffed him full of stories about us said dick that's the way that rascally teacher expects to get square on captain putnam by ruining the reputation of the school oh it's mostly lou flapp's fault put in the pupil who had been at the hall for some time the very first day flapp arrived he had a row with little tommy brown and knocked tommy down and a few days after that he had a fight with jack raymond and was pounding jack good when mr strong came up and made them run off in different directions he's a good deal of the same kind of a bully that dan baxter was if that's the case he had better keep his distance said dick determinedly 
i don't want any quarrels but i despise a bully thoroughly so do i i wonder if this flip-flap ever heard of dan baxter put in tom if he has he ought to profit by the example hello tom's got a new name for flap said one of the boys isn't his name flip-flap questioned tom innocently or is it flapjack it will be flop down if he ever gets into a fight with dick said larry and then followed a general laugh i really don't want any more fights said dick when he could be heard i came back to putnam hall to dig in and learn something i've had enough adventures to last a lifetime if the others will only leave me alone i'll leave them alone but if they won't leave you alone dick asked george granbury then they had better look out for themselves that's all was the reply of the eldest rover End of chapter eight chapter nine of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield the slipper box recording is in the public domain reading by matt Ferrar. chapter nine settling down to study dick meant what he said concerning coming back to putnam hall for the sake of learning something he felt that he had lost too much time from school already to lose more and he pitched in with a vigor that was indeed surprising i don't see how you can do it said tom one day i can't to save my life yet tom was by no means a poor scholar and if he did not stand at the head of his class he was not far from it sam was also doing his best and all of this gratified captain putnam exceedingly it shows they can work as well as play was what the captain told himself and he wrote anderson rover a long letter in which he praised the boys for their efforts the boys fell into their places at the academy with a naturalness that was surprising when one considered the adventures that had but lately befallen them over and over again did they have to tell of their doings while on the pacific and as crusoes and some of the cadets never tired of listening to the stories a few including lou flapp did not believe them true but the majority did and that was enough for the rovers dick was now advancing in years and he knew that before long he would either have to go into business or to college which he had not yet fully decided to tell the truth the thought of separating from his brothers was exceedingly distasteful to him if i went to college i'd like you fellows to be with me he said one day to tom and sam there would be no fun in going alone that's true answered tom but if you wanted us to go together you'd have to wait for sam and me to catch up with you well i might spend a year or so in traveling while i waited or sam and you might hurry up a little answered the eldest rover during those days but little out of the ordinary happened dick took a special care to avoid lou flapp and the tall youth did not attempt to bother him it was soon learned that flapp was more of a braggart than anything else and then even some of the smaller boys grew less afraid of him as already told it had been decided by captain putnam to have the cadets elect a new set of officers for the term and these officers were to be chosen in a somewhat different manner than heretofore in the past said the captain when addressing the students on the subject you have been permitted to elect whoever you please to any office from major down this has occasionally resulted in someone being chosen who while he might be a good scholar and a good fellow generally was not exactly fitted to a military position on that account i have made a change next wednesday and thursday i shall hold a general examination in military matters only and the twenty pupils standing highest shall be the ones eligible for the positions of major captain and first and second lieutenants on these twenty names you shall vote as heretofore as we now have three companies here we shall want a major three captains and six lieutenants making a total of ten officers after that each company shall choose its own corporals and sergeants the company marching best on parade the following saturday shall have the honor of carrying the flag until after the annual encampment which this year will begin a month from today at the mention of the annual encampment the cadets set up a chair then 
outing was looked forward to with great interest where are we going this year asked george granbury it's a secret i believe answered larry colby but i am pretty certain that we are going further away than usual i hope we go into the mountains or along some other lake where the fishing is fine put in tom yes that would suit me too the announcement concerning the examination in military matters also caused much talk and many of the guests began at once to study military tactics harder than ever while drills became a pleasure instead of a hardship i'm going to win some kind of a place said larry earnestly even a lieutenantship would be better than nothing i am sure i am going to win put in william philander tubbs i am perfect in every kind of a drill good for butter tub the perfect man sang out tom billy you want to have your picture done in oil to hang alongside of washington's in the library don't you dare to call me butter tub or billy either you rude thing snorted tubbs and walked away in outraged dignity dot examinations vos diggled me already said hans vot i don't know apout dem military tics you don't know ain't it i vill pee by der top of der class so quick as never vos you pet yourself and he nodded his head as if he meant every word of it dick rover said but little on the subject but he meant to win if he possibly could and so did tom sam felt he was as yet too young to become anything but a sergeant so he did not enter the competition with much vigor lew flapp was not a particularly bright pupil but there was one thing outside of bag punching that he could do well and that was to drill he took to military tactics naturally and knew nearly every rule that the book of instructions contained it's going to be an easy matter to get into the chosen twenty the tall boy told himself but after that will the cadets elect me to one of those positions he wanted to be major of the battalion but doubted if he could muster up sufficient friends to elect him the examination in military matters came off on the afternoon of the following wednesday and on thursday morning captain putnam was very thorough in the work and made the pupils do certain things over and over again and write the answers to long lists of questions it has given me great pleasure to conduct this examination he said on the day following it shows that the average in military knowledge is much higher than it was last term the following are the pupils who have passed given in the order of merit and then he read the list of names lou flapp came first dick rover next larry colby third george granby fourth and the others including tom and fred garrison followed neither william philander tubbs nor hans mueller were mentioned i deep me der vos a mistake i dot said the german boy or else i vos know so much der captain didn't want nobody to know how about it and this raised a laugh it's an outrage declared tubbs an outrage i shall request my parents to withdraw me from this institution and he wrote a letter home that very night but his parents refused to grant his request probably they knew of his shortcomings and thought a few terms at putnam hall would do him good lew flapp was much pleased over the fact that he headed the list of those who had passed and nobody could blame him for this but he immediately made himself more obnoxious than ever by going around among the cadets and declaring that he was the only one to be elected to the office of major is mine by right he said it wouldn't be fair to elect anybody else but dick rover and larry colby stand almost as high said one of the cadets captain putnam said your average was ninety six per cent while rover's average was ninety five per cent and larry colby's was ninety four per cent a difference of one or two per cent out of a possible hundred isn't much i don't care retorted lew flapp i ought to be elected major and that is all there is to it when dick was approached he had but little to say i didn't expect to stand so high he declared i don't know that i care to be made a major if i get to be a captain or first lieutenant i shall be well content you know i was a second lieutenant once 
my percentage is more than i expected said larry i really didn't think i was so well up in military matters now if the boys want me for an officer i'll take whatever they give me and that is what i say added george granbury ditto myself put in tom even a second lieutenantship will not be declined by yours truly after this there was a good deal of canvassing and log rolling as it is called lou flapp spent much money in secret treating boys when at the village and elsewhere by this means he gathered quite a band of followers around him he is going to win by hook or by crook observed songbird powell he acts just like some of those politicians who don't care what they do so long as they win i am not going to spend a cent on the boys declared dick i don't believe in buying votes there was a strict rule at putnam hall that no cadet should touch liquor of any kind excepting when ordered by the doctor this rule had been broken in the past by dan baxter and a few others but the majority of the cadets respected the rule and kept it but lou flapp had always been allowed to drink when at home and now he frequently drank on the sly when down to cedarville on these excursions he was generally joined by a weak-minded boy named hurdy who was usually willing to do whatever flapp desired done one day just before the election for officers was to come off lou flapp called ben hurdy to him i am going down to cedarville this evening he said i want you to go along and invite jackson and pender and rockley going to have a good time asked ben hurdy yes and you can tell the others so and tell them if they know some others who want a good time and can keep their mouths shut about it to bring them along but mind hurdy we want no blabbers all right flap i'll get the right fellows answered ben hurdy and ran away to fulfil his questionable errand End of chapter nine chapter ten of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter ten an adventure in cedarville on the same evening that lou flapp and his particular cronies went down to cedarville to have a good time in a very questionable way dick rover and songbird powell also visited the village one to buy some handkerchiefs and the other to invest in a book he had ordered from the local bookseller and newsdealer i heard that lou flapp was going to cedarville said powell while on the way do you know dick i don't like that fellow at all neither do i songbird it will make me sick if he is elected major of the battalion nevertheless the cadets have a right to elect whom they please i know that as well as you do but i can't stand flapp's domineering ways and he is bound to grow worse if he is put in authority as to that i shall not stand being bullied came from dick with flashing eyes i'll let him go just so far and if he goes any further he'll have to beware both boys were excellent walkers and it was not long before cedarville was reached dick soon had the handkerchiefs wanted and then powell led the way to the bookstore to obtain a volume of humorous verses he had ordered the week previous i don't see why you buy verses since you can make them up so readily said dick with a smile oh i like to see what the other fellows are doing answered his friend i saw some more of your cadets in town to-night said the bookseller while wrapping up the book yes i believe half a dozen or more came down returned powell having a special celebration to-night not that i am aware of why do you ask put in dick who knew the bookseller well oh i only thought some of the boys were flying their kite pretty high that's all and the man closed one eye suggestively where did you meet the fellows well mm, i'd rather not say rover you see i don't want to make trouble for anybody are they in town yet i presume they are but don't say i mentioned it please pleaded the bookseller no more was said and having paid for the book powell walked out with dick behind him if those fellows are drinking it's a jolly shame declared dick when they were out of hearing what do you think about it songbird exactly as you do dick shall we hunt them up 
what good will it do lou flapp won't listen to what you say and i'm sure i don't want to play the spy and report him but what if he is leading some innocent students astray he has had half a dozen young chaps dangling at his heels lately i know that there was a pause we might look into some of the places as we pass them very slowly they walked up and down the main street of cedarville a thing easy to do since the stores extended only a distance of two blocks then they passed to a side street upon which two new places had recently been built one of the new places was a butcher shop and this was dark and deserted next to it was a new resort known as mike sherry's palace and this was well lit up and evidently in full blast if flapp is drinking he is evidently in this place remarked dick but i don't see anything of him he added after peering through the swinging doors they tell me the sherry has a room upstairs also for drinking purposes returned powell maybe flapp and his friends are up there they wouldn't want to be seen in public you must remember that is true but how do they get upstairs through the saloon there may be a back way let us look they walked around to the rear of the building and here found a door leading into a back hall but the door was locked this is the way up i feel sure said dick somebody has locked the door as a safeguard then i'm afraid we'll have to give it up not yet songberg dick had been looking over toward the rear of the butcher shop see the painters are at work here and have left one of their ladders wonder if we can't move it over and put it up under one of those windows the matter was talked over for a minute and then the two boys took hold of the long ladder and did as dick desired this may be a wild goose chase was powell's comment and if it is and mike sherry discovers us he'll want us to explain maybe he'll take us for burglars you can keep shady if you want to songbird i'm going up and so speaking dick began to mount the ladder the window under which the ladder had been placed was open from the top only and a half curtain over the lower portion hid what was beyond from view so in order to look over the curtain dick had to climb to the very top of the ladder and then brace his feet on the window sill he could now hear voices quite plainly and presently heard lou flapp speak i'm on the right track he called softly to powell they are in the room next to this one but the door between is wide open shall i come up suit yourself i'm going inside as good as his word dick slipped over the top of the lowered window sash and an instant later stood in the room which was but dimly lit then he tiptoed his way behind a door and peeped into the room beyond seven cadets were present including lou flapp ben hurdy and their particular cronies jackson pender and rockley the other were two young cadets named joe davis and harry moss on the table in the centre of the room stood a platter of chicken sandwiches and also several bottles containing beer and wine and a box of cigars evidently all of the crowd had been eating and drinking and now several were filling the apartment with tobacco smoke come smoke up moss cried lou flapp shoving the box of cigars toward one of the younger cadets don't be afraid it won't kill you thank you flapp but i i guess i won't tonight pleaded harry moss whose face was strangely flushed why not i i don't feel well the drinking has made me feel sick oh nonsense here take the cigar and smoke up it will brace your nerves and you davis have another glass of something to drink went on lou flapp pouring out a glassful and handing it to the one addressed thank you flapp but i don't want any more answered joe davis he looked as ill at ease as did harry moss don't you want to be sociable demanded the tall boy it isn't that flapp i i guess i've had enough already ah don't be a sissy davis here i'll drink with you and then i'll smoke a cigar with moss if you are going to be men you want to start right in hey rockley that's right lou answered rockley as he lit a fresh cigar what you need is another glass davis came from pender it will act as a bracer just try it and see i 
i don't want to get get faltered davis get what intoxicated really i i don't who said anything about that demanded lou flapp in apparent anger don't be a fool one more glass won't hurt you here take it and he almost forced the liquor to joe davis's lips but before he could accomplish his wicked design dick rover leapt quickly into the apartment and hurled the glass from the big boy's hand for shame flap he cried for shame and that's what i say too came from powell who was close behind dick every cadet in the room was astonished and all leapt to their feet what's up cried rockley they have been spying on us came from jackson talk about meanness this is the limit added pender i want you to leave joe davis and harry moss alone went on dick as calmly as he could it's an outrage to get them to drink and smoke against their will are you two alone asked lou flapp glancing nervously over the newcomer's shoulders we are what right had you to come here well we took the right then you enjoy playing the spy no flapp said dick boldly but i do enjoy doing davis and moss a favor what do you mean by that i mean that i am going to stand by them so you shall not get them to drink any more or smoke hm. what right have you to interfere maybe he's going to squeal to the captain put in jackson if he does that i'll punch his head for him roared lou flapp who had been drinking just enough to make him ugly and unreasonable i did not come here to squeal on anybody answered dick i know you did and i'm going to pound you well for it howled lou flapp and on the instant he leapt forward and aimed a savage blow with his fist at dick's head End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Ferrar. chapter eleven a quarrel and its result had the blow landed as intended dick rover would have received a bloody nose and might perhaps have lost one or two teeth but dick was on the alert and he dodged to one side so the blow landed on songbird powell's shoulder see here what do you mean by that flap demanded powell who was no weakling i meant to hit rover was the answer hands off flap cried dick i didn't come here to fight but i can defend myself we'll see roared the unreasonable tall boy and made another rush at dick but in a twinkling he found himself flat on the floor where he had been thrown with a suddenness that took away his breath ha that ain't fair put in rockley you let lou alone i will when he leaves me alone retorted dick he turned to harry moss and joe davis do you want to stay here any longer no answered both of the small cadets promptly i didn't wish to come at all but ben hurdy urged it continued harry moss and pender said it would do no harm added joe davis he said we were going to have nothing but sandwiches root beer and soda look here davis you keep your mouth shut cried pender you knew exactly what to expect you know mike sherry don't run a temperance hotel he continued with a sneer at these words joe davis grew pale yes i know it now and if i ever get out of it i shan't come again oh you're too good to live broke in jackson you ought to be laid away in a glass case for safe keeping davis is all right and he has more brains than you jackson came from dick if you want to make a fool of yourself by drinking and smoking i shan't stop you but you shan't drag joe and harry into it against their will that's the way to talk dick said powell let us clear out and take the youngsters with us by this time lou flapp had recovered from the flooring received and now he approached dick once more do you want me to hammer you good rover he panted as i said before flap i didn't come here to fight but i can defend myself i propose to leave quietly and take harry and joe with me supposing i won't let you leave i don't think you'll stop me 
come flap don't make a fool of yourself put in powell we didn't come here to quarrel but to urge all of the crowd to quit drinking you know it's against the hall rules and regulations and you intend to blab on us not at all i'm not that kind and dick rover isn't either i know how to fix em came from pender with a cunning look in his eye how asked flap and rockley in concert our word is as good as anybody's if they say they found us at mike sherry's we can say that we found them there too for all we know they were drinking below before they came up that's it interrupted lou flap thinking he saw a way of implicating dick and powell mike sherry never lets anybody in his saloon without they drink something it's as plain as day came from rockley they had all the liquor they wanted before they came up and now they want to stop our sport your story might be believed were it not for one thing said dick trying to keep calm come on harry come joe and he whispered something into their ears oh all right said harry moss and he retreated from the room speedily followed by joe davis hi come back here you young scamps roared lou flap and then he made for the doorway leading to the next room not so fast flap said dick and blocked the opening with his own form while powell stood directly behind say fellows moss and davis are getting out of the window cried flap in astonishment that's the way rover and powell must have gotten in came from pender exactly answered dick and that proves we didn't have to stop below for liquor he added triumphantly look here i don't mean to let those fellows go yet blustered lou flap let me get at them not to-night flap scarcely had dick spoken when the tall boy flung himself forward the pair grappled and a moment later both went down with dick on top hit him dick don't let him get the best of you cried powell and an instant later found himself tackled by pender and jackson for the moment ben hurdy who had remained silent during the most of the talk did nothing but then he ran forward and watching his chance kicked dick in the side of the head with his foot the quarrel was now on in earnest and in the midst of the melee a burly waiter came rushing from below demanding to know what was the matter a pair of spies shouted pender hope us to give them a sound thrashing pat sure oil will that was the answer and the waiter joined in the attack on dick and powell it was with a mighty effort that powell managed to throw off his assailants then he leapt for the window reached the ladder and fairly slipped to the ground let up on dick rover he called when safe if you don't i'll rouse the constable and have somebody locked up confound him muttered rockley we had better dust out if he calls a constable the jig will be up with a parting kick at dick he rushed down the back stairs to the resort and unlocked the door taking care that powell should not see him he darted into the gathering darkness ben hurdy followed rockley and a moment later pender and jackson did the same then flap came staggering down the stairs holding his nose from which the blood was flowing freely let's get back to the hall as quickly as we can he said to the others and if we are examined we can deny everything all right said pender but what did you do to rover somebody kicked him and he's about half unconscious i left him to the tender mercies of pat the waiter and then lou flap and his cronies hurried away on the road leading to putnam hall dick might have defended himself but he was cruelly kicked several times and partly lost consciousness as already told in a dim uncertain manner he felt himself raised up and carried below and then put on the grass of the yard behind mike cherry's resort when he was able to move he sat up and then arose to his feet slowly at that moment songbird powell discovered him powell had been up the ladder a second time to find the window closed and locked dick he exclaimed are you badly hurt i i don't know was the slow reply how are you i'm all right where are flap and the rest they ran away and harry and joe they are waiting for us down at the turn in the road dick put his hand to his head to find a big lump directly back of the ear his ear was cut and there was a scratch on his chin 
they didn't fight fair he explained when he felt a little stronger they kicked me when i was down aided by powell he made his way to a pump and there bathed his head and procured a drink of water while both boys were recovering from the adventure all the lights in mike sherry's resort were put out and every door and window was locked he wants to steer clear of trouble said powell i put the blame on lou flapp answered dick to my mind he is about as mean as any boy around here of course we can't report him dick no i'm no tale-bearer songbird but he ought to be punished he'll make a fine major if he's elected went on powell as he and dick started for the road leading to the academy he shall never be elected if i can help it i am with you on that they found harry moss and joe davis walking slowly toward putnam hall joe seemed to feel all right now that he was out in the fresh evening air but harry complained of a strange sickness at the stomach it was horrid of lou flapp to make us drink said the young cadet i told him i didn't want anything stronger than soda but he and pender made me take it i think the walk will do you good harry answered dick kindly here take my arm and songbird can take your other arm when the hall was reached they found that lou flapp and his cronies had already gone to bed dick took harry and joe to their dormitory and then rejoined powell going to keep mum asked the latter for the present answered the eldest rover but after this let us keep a sharp eye on flap pender and company and so it was agreed End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter twelve the election for officers on the following morning all of the cadets but harry moss appeared in the mess room joe davis says harry is quite sick said powell to dick that's too bad have they sent for a doctor i don't know when lou flapp heard that harry was sick he grew pale and during the morning session could scarcely fix his mind on his studies i hope the little fool don't blab on us was his thought if he does there is no telling what the captain will do he's altogether too strict for comfort in some things no doctor was sent for so it was finally agreed that harry moss was not as ill as had been supposed but the young cadet did not enter the schoolroom for all of that day the sickness had frightened captain putnam who was not yet over the scarlet fever scare and he questioned harry thoroughly about what he had been doing and about what he had been eating and drinking at first the young cadet did not dare to tell the truth but finally he blurted out that he had taken a glass of liquor against his will and it had turned his stomach in a most painful manner where did you get the liquor demanded captain putnam sternly i-i-oh must i tell you sir yes harry i-that is lou flapp oh sir i don't want to be a tattle-tale did lou flapp give you the liquor answer me at once yes sir he and another cadet named pender but sir i don't want to hurt them i-i and here harry burst into tears where was this down in cedarville sir but i-i i shan't say any more captain putnam and after that harry remained silent as it was plain to see that he was suffering captain putnam did not push the matter but he called lou flapp and pender into his private office and interviewed the unworthy pair for fully half an hour to do such a thing is outrageous said the captain if i hear of it again i shall dismiss you from the hall at once on the following morning one of the assistant teachers made a brief announcement that filled the entire school with curiosity on next monday you are to have an election of officers for the term said he as you know twenty cadets were selected as worthy of being elected the list has since been cut down to eighteen lou flapp and augustus pender will not run at this announcement dick and powell looked at each other significantly all of the other cadets looked around to find flapp and pender but the pair were absent nor did they put in an appearance at all until the next school session the captain found it out in some way said dick to powell shouldn't wonder if harry moss let the cat out of the bag was the answer 
it's queer about flap and pender declared tom to his older brother do you know why they were dropped yes tom but i don't want you to say anything about it there's a report around that they were found cutting loose in the village put in sam well as i said before i don't want to speak about it went on dick a few of the boys dared to question flap and pender but got no satisfaction if i want to drop out i reckon i can do it growled flap and that was as much as either he or his crony would say with flap out of the race there was considerable curiosity to know who would be elected for the term each set of cadets had their favorite candidates and the spirit of rivalry ran high but most of the candidates were good-natured about it and especially dick and tom rover and george ranbury fred garrison and larry colby it had been decided that the cadets should first elect the major then the three captains and then the six lieutenants all to be selected according to the highest number of votes received the voting began on monday immediately after breakfast captain putnam had slips passed around and on these each cadet wrote down his choice for major i will read the result said the captain a few minutes after the poll was declared closed and he read as follows whole number of votes cast ninety six lawrence colby has sixty seven the next highest student has nineteen lawrence colby is declared elected major of the battalion for the present term including the annual encampment hurrah for major larry colby cried tom and a rousing cheer followed while captain putnam strode over and shook hands with the newly elected commanding officer i must congratulate you major colby he said warmly i must say i am well satisfied with the choice of our students thank you sir answered larry and blushed in spite of himself we will now proceed to the election of the three captains went on captain putnam remember the three standing highest on the list will be declared elected respected again slips were passed around and again the students marked down the names of their favorites three upon each slip counting up the vote with captains took longer than that for major but soon the captain had his statement ready and the cadets listened in silence as he, as he proceeded to make his announcement whole number of votes cast two hundred and eighty eight richard rover has eighty two fred garrison has sixty seven mark romer has fifty nine the next highest student has twenty eight richard rover is elected captain of company a frederick garrison captain of company b and mark romer captain of company c for this term and during the annual encampment hurrah for dick rover hurrah for fred garrison and mark romer and the students cheered as wildly as ever while captain putnam once more offered his congratulations captain rover my hand said larry coming up thank you major colby answered dick and then both gave a grip that meant a good deal we seem to be right in it observed the newly elected major that's true answered dick we shall now proceed to the election of six lieutenants went on captain putnam and once more the slips went the rounds and the boys did a lot of writing and speculating as each put down the six names required this vote was rather a long one and captain putnam had two teachers help him in tabulating the result this contest must make flap sick whispered powell to dick while the students were taking it easy on the parade ground well he brought it on himself was the brief reply i'll wager he tries to square up with us especially if he thinks we told on him a bugle sounded calling the cadets together and once more captain putnam read the result whole number of votes cast five hundred and seventy six john powell has eighty three william merrick has seventy six walter durham has seventy one thomas rover has sixty eight george granbury has fifty one raymond holbrook has forty three the next highest cadet has thirty eight john powell is declared first lieutenant of company a william merrick first lieutenant of company b walter durham first lieutenant of company c thomas rover second lieutenant of company a george granbury second lieutenant of company b and raymond holbrook second lieutenant of company c for this term and during the annual encampment as this announcement was made there was a breathless silence then came a rousing cheer and the various successful ones were congratulated by the captain and their friends 
well songbird it seems you are to be my first lieutenant said dick as he shook hands with powell that suits me first rate and i am to be second lieutenant said tom coming up with sam in the company as private this begins to look like a family affair oh i'm going to make you fellows toe the mark now laughed dick no more skylarking if you please lieutenant rover all right captain rover replied tom with a stiff salute that was side-splitting taking it all the way through the election was declared to be a popular success of course some of the defeated candidates were bitterly disappointed but they did their best to hide their true feelings william philander tubbs had declined to vote and lou flapp and gus pender had kept entirely out of sight while the voting was going on the two cronies took themselves to the gymnasium and there declared their hatred of dick rover he is responsible for this muttered flapp clenching his fists and rating his teeth but for him i might at this minute be major of the battalion or one of the captains oh but won't i square up some day what will you do questioned pander remember i'm just as down on him as you are i don't know yet gus but i'll do something all right when you are ready to act let me know and i'll help you all i can answered gus pender End of chapter 12